Investors Chronicle. Hello and welcome back to the IC Interviews podcast. I'm Dave Baxter. I'm the funds editor on the Investors Chronicle, and I'm delighted today to have with us Stuart Widdison. Stuart works on the Edition Investment Trust. That's a UK smaller companies fund that launched back in 2018. The Edition approach is to invest in a concentrated portfolio of listed UK smaller companies, those which are typically too small for inclusion in the FTSE 250. The team tends to take some pretty big positions in such businesses and uses what they dub constructive corporate engagement to help turn what should be good companies into excellent companies. They're in part using private equity experience in the public sphere. So Stuart, thanks for coming on. How are you doing? Very well, thanks. Thanks for having me on the show. So, you know, Edition has, I think, turned heads since launching, um, perhaps because of this slightly different approach and because, at least until recently, the returns have been pretty strong. Uh, this year has been more challenging. But I, I thought just to kick off, it'd be interesting just to kind of elaborate on in a lot of your literature. You talk about having a private equity mindset in the kind of listed space. What does that actually entail? I think there are five things, Dave, that we think the way we run money is quite different to many of our broader peers. Uh, the first thing is we're not looking to beat an index. The, our objective is to try and double our NAV per share every five years, which is equivalent of 15% annualised return. And we think if we deliver that, our clients are going to be very, very happy. Um, the second thing that we look at is we focus, we think, on valuing companies in a different way to the broader market. So many of our peers tend to look at companies on P ratios. We look at things quite differently because we've been used to buying and selling whole companies. We consider what any company that we look at is worth to a third party. Uh, how much would they pay to buy the whole business? And then look to buy a company at a significant discount to that. So again, it, it's quite different to just looking at P ratio. Uh, the third thing, we're very, very selective. So we have a, a highly focused portfolio. We've currently got 16 holdings. We typically have between 16 and 20. You know, we're, we're much more conviction than, than than many managers that might have 100 stocks. Over the long term, you know, it works very, very well. As you said, this year we've had a couple of banana skins, but that's <laughs> not unusual. It typically happens over, over you know, a five-year period. In fact, we only actually outperform on a relative basis two-thirds of the time. The final thing is we look for companies with a lot of self-help potential. So going back to your intro, finding good that could be excellent, we really like those transformation situations because even if the market doesn't go anywhere, if you combine to a business of a sensible valuation and that business improves itself, it's going to be worth more in the future, even in a flat market. So that is the core focus um, of every investment to find basically a decent company, at a sensible valuation that we think we're going to make money out of um, and also that we think can be improved. Uh, you mentioned banana skins, and we'll definitely get into those in a bit. But I suppose more generally, it has been a very challenging market for you know many assets, many sectors, but also you know small caps and mid caps have been uh, very challenged. What kind of, I mean, you mentioned self-help potential. What kind of characteristics are you looking for in the companies you, you select? Because I, I suppose, you know, if I were to glance at the market now, I could see lots of things which perhaps optically look cheap. But you know, how do you how do you avoid the value traps? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. So, we really like niche market leaders. Um, we believe over time that if you can invest in a niche market leader, you'll better get a much better return than its underlying market. But we particularly like niche market leaders that aren't performing as a market leader should. So they might not have operating margins in line with the peer group you'd expect the market leaders to actually have the highest margins in the peer group you would also expect the market leader to be growing probably faster than its peers but sometimes because of historical management that's not happened but we really like market leaders we think them if properly managed they're much more covetable than the market three or four player and they should be the price leader and particularly in times of inflation that's really, really important to be able to at least match your cost increases with price increases to your customers we look at companies also that have a particularly strong position in their supply chain. Um, and by that, I mean, typically, ideally, not many competitors, lots and lots of suppliers and lots and lots of customers. So they're in a very, very strong economic position. And we like companies that also have significant barriers to somebody 
coming uh, coming and starting up against them. So quite a lot of our companies have significant IP protection um, or they might have significant scale economies, which means it's just not worth somebody coming into the market and competing against them. There tend to be quite international companies as well. So one of the views around investing in the UK small company sector is you're buying a retailer or you're buying a Midlands metal basher that has total domestic exposure. And in fact, in our portfolio, 76% of revenues from our portfolio companies are generated from outside of the UK. And in fact, we have a couple of companies that manufacture here that export 98% of, uh, of their turnover. And it just happens that they're, they're listed in here because of an accent of history or or they work in such a niche that they had to export to grow their business. And the real opportunity at the moment is, if you're going back to the valuation things we talked about, many of these companies are trading at significant discount to their international peers' valuations, basically because they're listed here, because the UK equities at the moment are so out of favour, particularly small companies. So it's a really fertile hunting ground at the moment. Yeah, I mean, one, I suppose one interesting element of your approach and your particular background is you seem to have gone from kind of the private equity sphere into the, the public space, which perhaps seems to go against the grain given people are worried about de-equitisation and then specifically with the UK, people are worried about things like, uh, you know, UK companies listing overseas, getting bought out and so on. What's your kind of optimistic case there and why why are you now a kind of public equity man rather than a private equity man? So, so I made the change quite a long time ago and I, I, I don't know, probably the most contrarian thing I've done. <laughs> um, but I think... My gut feel is we've gone through a period of excessive private equity in, in periods of zero interest rates. You know, it was quite easy to make money as a buyout fund when the cost of debt wasn't very much. But now interest rates have gone back to some sort of normal level. And yes, they, they'll probably fall they'll probably fall from where we want to peak. They'll probably go out to somewhere between three and four percent. It makes private equity as an asset class it, it makes it much harder to make money. It's not impossible. But we, I suspect we've probably seen the, the peak of private equity. Conversely, we think IPOing a business, potentially there's, there's more of an even playing field. And if you look back at the mid-1990s, there were many private equity houses that saw IPO as an exit route. Now, what I think needs to happen, so I think we've had, we're close to peak de-equitisation. Um, what I think is likely to happen is f- institutional funds will come back into the small mid-cap sector the maths mean there are fewer companies to invest in. So as capital goes in, the buyer strike finishes and the ratings of those companies will go up. That momentum will probably, funnily enough, attract more capital in and suddenly the IPO market opens up again and I suspect it's probably going to be Q4 next year. And that means the number of quoted companies in small mid-cap will start to grow again. So, And that historically in the mid-90s went on for two or three years and you had really, really high-quality, reasonably priced companies IPOing because it was seen as a good exit route. That's my gut feel of what's going to happen over the next three to five years. And and again, it's happened before. I think that view is shared by many small mid-cap managers. Mm, interesting. So some uh, perhaps some sense of optimism for people who've uh, seen the sector take such a battering in, in, in the last 12 months or so. Does it not, though, I mean, higher rates and kind of higher cost of money and everything, does that surely that also has kind of a negative effect on your your kind of area of choice? What does that mean for you now in terms of trying to, I suppose, separate the wheat from the chaff? Hmm. Uh, I think that's a very good point. I think we're not really a growth investor. And if you look at the exuberance of valuations over the last decade or so, it's typically been in, in, in growth valuations. And if you look at stylistically and small, small cap fund performance, growth and momentum investing did particularly well during the period of zero interest rates. And that style, you look at all the funds that have that focus, that style peaked in, in August 2021. And that's probably been the style that's been the worst hit. Mm. You know, it's it's the it's the you know, it's the growth compounders and almost a mentality that it didn't matter what price you were paying, the rating always went up and the earnings always went up. So that style has really, really struggled. If you look back at the long term statistics that Numis produces on small company investing, uh, small company value actually massively outperforms growth over the long term. So the period of zero interest rates and low interest rates has almost been an anomaly. So I think it rebalances whether growth or value is going to perform. Now, we neither. We are more special situations and reasonably priced growth investors. And we think particularly at the moment, 
the the playing field of that style is uh, you know it's much more level compared with value and growth than it has been for some time. And I think our our view is look, there's so much rating to go for in a lot of these companies that whether or not we beat the markets or not is secondary. We think the the prospect for returns looks pretty good from here. We talked about how we price our capital, aiming to get fifteen percent IRR across the cycle. Uh, the average portfolio company is generating 6% revenue growth, about 7% free cash yield. We're almost getting to that 15% return without any prospect of re-rating or earnings growth ahead of sales. And the average rating of uh, companies in our sector is way, way below the long-term trend. So the prospect for re-rating driving much more of a kicker in the next five years compared with our, our first five years, there's much more prospect of that actually allowing us to generate much higher absolute return. Uh, I saw a portfolio company the other day, and they're a, you know, they've got slightly more stretched balance sheet than most companies, and there was debate whether or not they needed to raise equity to pay a bit of debt down. And fortunately, this company has lots of options, lots of things it can do to avoid raising capital. But the chief executive said, "I'm not going to raise equity at the moment because because the cost of my equity is too expensive. And why would I raise expensive equity to pay down, you know, debt at?" It's costing me ten percent or so. I said, "That's really interesting. How would you price your equity at the moment? Thirty percent. That's what he thinks the annualised return of the cost of his equity should right. be. And that's that's not dissimilar to the types of opportunities we're seeing in the market at the moment. So, notwithstanding what you've said about interest rates, um, I think interest rates almost certainly have peaked in the UK. They'll start to come come down, and the types of returns that we think are going to be generated from small companies look very attractive in that environment." If things are looking more encouraging, how does that affect the sort of composition of the fund? I mean, would you would you be tempted to sort of broaden out and perhaps have more holdings than you currently do? I was just thinking that, you know, in difficult times, investors are sometimes tempted simply to, to stick with their, their best ideas and then they know, they know best and that ends up in a very concentrated approach. But perhaps you would be tempted to become less concentrated given you have such big positions at the minute. Yeah, so I think we'd... we'd... It's unlikely we'd ever go above uh, 20 stocks. So uh, we we ration our capital very carefully into what we think our best side is. And to be frank, you know, we are we're running with virtually no cash at the moment, which is very unusual. I've been running this strategy for about 15 years. We typically have 7 or 8% in cash. So we are pretty invested. We really like the opportunities we've got in the portfolio at the moment. We, have, we always have a, a bench of the next best ideas. And if we had more capital, we could easily deploy capital at well above, we think, 15% returns. But we like what we've got. I think if we had a bit more capital, and we are raising a bit of capital through the drip issuance of the trust at the moment, you know, we could easily put it to work at the moment. So turning to what you do hold, you mentioned the, the kind of banana skins, and there have been some interesting developments with quite a few of your holdings this year. One name I am sort of dying to discuss is Elementus, the kind of specialty chemicals name. Um, we had some interesting turns with it this year when um, Franklin Templeton, one of the kind of big investors, basically called for the company to kind of sell itself. And then Elementus turned back and and said, no, we, we don't want to do that. We don't think that's a good idea. Perhaps take us through your stance and, you know, what do you expect now? What's your kind of approach going forward? Yeah. So uh, I think it's a fascinating case study. I mean, Franklin Templeton is a, is a very mainstream uh, well-respected institution, and I believe this is the first open letter they've written about a company in something like eight years. So there's clearly an element of frustration there about how things have gone. I think uh, if you look at the history of Elementus, so, so I should say we bought this company very well in the, the, the COVID month in 2000, March 2020, um, and the reason we liked it was because the company has significant asset backing. It's a specialty chemicals business, but it owns a lot of its own source of raw material in the form of mineral rights. So they have the world's um, only uh, commercially viable high-quality hetrite clay mine in California, which has decades of supply, and it also own, owns talc mines in Finland. The challenge that the company has had is that the company made a number of acquisitions prior to, to covid and the company overpaid for these acquisitions and they've just not performed. And on top of that, it's been hit by some cyclical weakness post-COVID. I think the company has has done a certain amount of transformation. It sold its specialty chemicals business over the last couple of years uh, in chromium, which the market generally didn't like, and it's quite a quite a volatile asset. So the company has been reshaping itself, but I think the pace of change has probably frustrated a number of the shareholders. And on top of that, I think that the company has failed to really demonstrate 
that it's added value to a sufficient extent after two aborted takeover um, approaches about uh, three years ago. So the company was approached by USP Minerals Technologies very publicly, and also another company, again, US listed, called InnerSpec. So I think the shells are frustrated saying, well, actually, you know, the company was, people were prepared to buy the whole company for, I think, uh, the InnerSpec bid was around, or interest was around £1.45, £1.50 three years ago. You adjust that for currency because it's a US dollar earner, you adjust it for the debt that the company's paid off. And the shares are trading significantly below where that bid approach had happened. So I think the the shells are looking for the company to proactively come out and and, and really get a step change on on financial performance. I don't think the story is over yet. I think that the share price perked up after the recent Capital Markets Day, um, but it's still trading at way below where I think most people see fair value. Um, I think watch this space. So uh, when it comes to those sort of like bumps in the roads, I suppose the kind of disagreements about the prospects of a sale, like what what do you as an investor do? I mean, I must admit, I find it quite ominous in your literature. You refer to, what is it, constructive corporate engagement, which sounds very mildly threatening to me, but uh, but yeah. Yeah, so I, I think our aim is to work to try and help build a consensus amongst the stakeholders about what needs to happen in a situation. I think there is a lot of frustration in, the, in this situation. And if you... It's one of the companies in our portfolio, and I know you want to talk about Essential a bit later, but if you, if this group didn't exist, you wouldn't invent it today. <laughs> we don't think there's much overlap between the talc business and the rest of the, uh, the hectorite-based coatings and uh, personal care business, and we think that the company is share price trading at a discount to the sum of parts. Uh, effectively, if you, if you were to think about who might be a better owner of the talc business, you could probably get a really good strategic price out of that and then effectively the remaining business would be valued more highly by the stock market or potentially other owners. So there's there's corporate work that needs to be done to look at that. And you know, that's something that we discussed with the chairman. And also we talk about the operating performance of the business. And it was notable that the recent Capital Markets Day, they've come out with a target to save $30 million in OPEX, operating costs. That compares with a base profitability of $100 million. And we felt for some time the company hadn't been performing to its margin potential. So, you know, these are all the discussions that happen behind closed doors. Um, but I think the key here is, you know, it's a good asset that's got some really interesting technology. Is it really performing to its potential, both in terms of the asset utilisation, but also the operating performance? I mentioned value traps earlier. Maybe value traps is a harsh term, but obviously the risk of kind of buying things cheap is that they simply stay cheap. Um, what would prompt you to kind of, call time on an investment if it hadn't realised that potential? Uh, excellent question. In fact, when we put our annual report out in March, we talked about we'd exited 30 investments in the first five years of the, the company and, and and which ones we had called time on. It's typically where, you know, we like private equity, we do a lot of research in advance and we have a thesis. We write down in a 20-page note why we're investing in this company, the checklist of things that that basically have lost us money before, are they present here? <laughs> make sure we don't repeat our mistakes. Uh, we tend to make different ones, but you know, don't repeat your mistakes. Um, but also, how are we going to make money out of a situation? And what tends to happen is when you live with a company over, over several years, um, either the company performs to plan, everything works out, you might get lucky, you might get unlucky, or basically you've got it wrong. And there's something you've misjudged about a situation. So we looked at one company a few years ago that we felt was trading on a big discount to some of parts. We carried on doing due diligence on it, and then we found out that what wasn't clear from the outside was one of the divisions that we put a relatively high multiple on had very, very high customer concentration. And high customer concentration is really the enemy of getting a high multiple for a company. So we reassessed our view of the value of that division and the value of the group then came down and we thought, actually, that looks less attractive than other things that we own. What we're not going to do is suddenly sell a company because it goes through a patch where a few things you know, go against the management team or there might be a slightly weak period of market demand. On a, th- on a three, five, six, seven year basis, that's just noise along the way. And that can actually provide buying opportunities. So to the to the situations we discussed this year, they've they've hit a rough patch in trading in, in a few areas, and the stock market has reacted disproportionately negative to that news. And in both cases, we've doubled the stake in the company because we think that the reaction was was uh, was totally over the top and uh, the baby was being thrown out with the bathwater. Mm, interesting. 
Okay, so let's turn, as you mentioned, let's turn to essential. So um, you're still your biggest holding, I believe? Or one yes, of your that's right. Holdings. Yep, yep. Um, so, you know, that's, uh, I don't know how you might describe it, maybe as a B2B media company or a mishmash of a few things. Um, but interestingly, about a month ago, they announced the proposed sale of their digital commerce arm. Um, what what are you now kind of expecting for Essential? And are you, I mean, are you happy if, if it does sort of split itself up and um, spin off various elements? Are, are you kind of happy holding the remaining business or, you know, what's, what's the approach now? Great question. So this was uh, an investment we made about 15 months ago because it was trading, we felt at the time, at a very, very substantial discount to some of parts. It wasn't well understood by, we felt, by the stock market. And... You're absolutely right. So a few weeks ago to announce the sale of its, its digital commerce business and actually its consumer reporting business, WGSN, on the same day. And the combined consideration for those disposals meant that the company's announced it's going to return £850 million to shareholders. And that was basically our pretty much our entry price, funny enough, about £2 a share. So first of all, the prices that they got for those assets, I think WGSM was probably slightly below our our best expectation. The digital commerce business, that was a positive surprise because the price was pretty good. And also the company had originally telegraphed that it might relist that business on NASDAQ. And that had caused some uncertainty amongst the shareholders. So the share price on the day of that announcement did very well. I think it went from just over £2 to £2.85, £2.90. The business that's going to be left after those uh, deals complete is uh, is an events business with really two key brands. The first is Can Lion, which is the effectively the Oscars for the industry, (laughs) the advertising industry. Um, But it's a single event, very very well known, and it's a it's pretty much a must go to and a must attend if you're in the advertising industry. And then the second brand is something called Money Twenty Twenty, which is basically a fintech uh, events business, which has. Uh, a US event in Las Vegas, a European event in Amsterdam, and a soon-to-be-launched event in, in Asia, in, in Bangkok. And it's a, it's, a, it's a great brand, very, very good long-term uh, uh, growth uh, history. When the disposals are made, that will be left, that events business with those two brands. And that, we think, you know, it's, it's a good business combined. Pre-Central Course, it made about 85 million EBITDA last year, so it's a, it's a sizable business. The share price of Essential today implies a very, very low valuation multiple for that business. And we don't think that's that's correct. Um, what do we expect to happen? Well, we'd be very, very surprised if that business remained independent. There's already been public speculation that Providence Private Equity that took Hive Private earlier this year, which was another of our portfolio companies, they're quite interested in buying money 2020. Um, we also think that somebody like Informer might quite like that asset as well. So I think watch this space. Where do we think it will end up? Uh, we think ultimately the breakup value is somewhere between, I don't know, £3.50 and £3.80 a share versus I think about £2.80 today. So there, there's still quite a lot to go for. So, um, you know, we've rebalanced the position a little bit, but we still think, you know, the the upside looks pretty attractive from here. On on your notes about private equity, you know, we discussed earlier that perhaps times will be harder for private equity or returns might be lower and so on. But does that also kind of remove one of your key exit routes, basically, on holdings? And how does that affect, you know, what you do? I think it removes a potential buyer. But if you if you look through many of our portfolio companies, a standalone private equity bid is, is not our exit of choice. And the main reason why is uh, a standalone private equity bid probably is not going to be the, the best payer for a company because they can't have cost synergies. So what we're always looking for is who a potential strategic owner of, of the business is. So uh, in, the, in the B2B space, for, uh, media space, for example, um, if we had an asset that had... Um, a similar business as part of the FT group, the FT group would buy that company and there would be cost synergies around head office costs, finance, back office. So they might buy an asset, a company that's made making 10 million a profit, but to the FT group, it might be worth 12 or 13. So somebody like the FT group for that business media business is always going to be a better buyer than a standalone company because they can get more profits out of it. If you look at where the portfolio has repositioned itself uh, really over the last 18 months, We've invested significantly more into the industrial sector, particularly B2B electronics. And in the short term, that's been probably slightly more difficult because those companies have had more muted trading outlooks. But over the medium to long term, the most obvious buyers of those types of companies, if they were to be taken over, are international trade buyers. And many of these companies derive the vast majority of their sales from overseas as well. So private equity are never going to be the right buyer for those businesses. So 
short answer is we don't really see it impacting you know our potential to 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 benefit from takeovers at all are there any other sort of sector biases that you're finding yourself taking in, in recent times yeah so it, it tends to go in waves Funny enough, actually post covid there was a big rush into healthcare companies that people perceive to be covid beneficiaries you know the testing yep. companies or what have you Whereas there are a whole bunch of other assets in the healthcare sector that had their operations and businesses disrupted by COVID. So one of our top 10 holdings is Spire Hospitals, which some of the listeners might know. It's one of the largest private hospital groups outside the M25 in the UK. Um, and you might remember in, during COVID, that company was pretty much commandeered by the government. So they weren't allowed to do any private business. And the company has a reasonable amount of debt, although that's more than offset by significant property assets. And at the trough of the market, that company was being valued at 50p. And the property asset backing of the company means the net asset value is about £1.80. So the market was taking a very, very pessimistic view of the company's prospects. We looked at it. Uh, we didn't quite get the bottom on this one, but we, we bought in at just over a pound as it was starting to recover because we realised that the government was going to effectively allow it to rebuild its private business again. And the prospects of that business looked very good. It's It's gone through a multi-year improvement process under uh, the chief exec justin ash and in fact it it won transformation of the year last year's plc awards so that became you know a, a thematic situation we looked at a drug distributor which again had had its supply chain disrupted in covid and i think had had a few earnings downgrades but fundamentally we thought actually yes the earnings have fallen but it's derated as well actually the earnings will come back and the rating will come back as well. And that company actually did, did end up getting, getting taken over at quite a significant premium. So so we go through themes um, where we think there's particular value at a particular time in the market. And because we're not looking to benchmark an index um, you know, or perform against an index, we can go wherever we see absolute and relative value. Mm, interesting. Um, I just want to touch on another couple of your, your holdings. One prominent name in the portfolio is NCC, a kind of cybersecurity play. I suppose that might be one of the names that you sort of group as uh, among your banana skin moments this year. They had a, a kind of profit warning earlier this year. Um, how do you kind of deal with that that sort of turn and, you know, what's what's the kind of outlook for that, that company now? Absolutely. So on the last day of our financial year, um, end of March, it's had a significant profit warning. And one of the benefits that we have of, of writing everything down and having these very detailed notes that we talked about earlier is mm. you go back and look at what's happened versus what we thought was going to happen and why we invest in the company. So um, one of the key reasons we invest in the company is it has two divisions. It has a cybersecurity business and also a software escrow business, which is which is almost a bit like an insurance type business. Historically, the the software escrow business had generated very stable cash flows but wasn't quite growing very fast. And all the growth and excitement is really around the cyber security business. And, and I think it's relatively uh, well uh, accepted that cyber security is, a, is quite an interesting growth area. And this company is one of the largest independents left in, in, in the world. So we looked at and the first question is why? Why has this company had a, had a problem? And it had turned out that during during the previous two years, there had seen significant and very uh, very material demand from the uh, US tech uh, clients, so the likes of Meta, uh, Alphabet, etc., and that business was going like a train, really, really strong and and quite profitable. And then, if you remember, in February this year, most of those clients suddenly went through cost cutting exercises, and that was a very destabilizing period for NCC and many other suppliers to them because their relationships had changed, and suddenly a very very positive and growing group of clients suddenly became extremely cost conscious and just projects were getting cancelled. The challenge for NCC was they couldn't re respond quick enough to take their own cost out to, re to basically respond to um, weakening demand. They couldn't do it quick enough in their financial year and they couldn't redeploy staff on those client accounts quick enough elsewhere. Now we looked at it and thought okay this is this is not fantastic news but what happened to the share price was we think a massive overreaction and, and we came back to the sum of parts similar to essential. The escrow business we felt was worth about 70p a share. Um, within their cyber business, they also have a managed services division, which does about 70 million of revenue, um, growing in mid-teens with mid to high teens margins. And that business we felt was worth maybe another 40p a share. So that gets you to about £1.10 a share. At the trough, the company's shares were trading at 85p, and it was putting a negative value of 30p a share, or almost £100 million, 
on a cybersecurity business, which even in the bad year did 200 million of revenue mm. and should make 15% margins. And we said, well, OK, this is not fantastic what's happened, but given where we are, we don't think fundamentally our thesis is broken. We think there is a team in there that had started to address the over-reliance on the, this US client base. And actually, the rest of the business is growing very, very well. So we think this is a blip. But from where we are now, this looks like a compelling three-year story, provided the team can deliver. And then we spent a reasonable amount of time re- going back and retesting our theses. We spent a lot of time referencing people and looking at what management teams had done and delivered before. And we came to the conclusion, actually, this was a great opportunity to double our position, which, which we did. And I'm very pleased to say since then, it looks like the company has stabilised itself. And certainly in September at their final results, it does look as though the worst is very much past the company. Mm, interesting. Uh, speaking of kind of, I suppose, putting money where your mouth is, with another one of your holdings, uh, XP Power, one uh, kind of interesting development this year is they, they did a fundraise And it seemed the management team actually had a relatively low uptake. I think the chief executive had something like £50,000 worth. What's your... What's your kind of view on that specifically and also more more generally things like kind of direct deals? So we like the management teams to have skin in the game. I think the interesting thing about that uh, fundraising is we want to see management teams put money in fundraisings. I can't comment about the specifics of that individual, but it's probably unlikely the team's going to get any bonus this year given the financial difficulties. So I think for, for many people to find £50,000 to put in fundraising is is you know, is, is still a reasonable chunk of money. <laughs> um, I think the fundraising itself was interesting. We talked about sentiment in our sector. Um, the shares had really been punished through, uh, we think, a, 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 again, a significant overreaction to, to what was perhaps not fantastic news. But at the trough, the company's shares were trading at about one times EV sales. If you look back over the last 15 years, I've known this company for quite a long time, on average, it trades at two times EV sales. And the company has a bit of debt. So if the company, the company shares were basically trading at probably a third of what their long-term average was after this bad news. Um, and whilst that was a temporary situation, as the market started to realise that that was massively overdone, the shares recovered. And when the company actually raised capital, it was a 50% higher price than the trough. It also raised the money at an 11% premium to the share price, which I don't think I've seen for many, many years Mm. at small cap. And we understand that fundraising was about two and a half times oversubscribed. So there was potentially 100 million of of buying interest in the fundraising at around £11.50. Part of the dislocation of the share price was driven by one shareholder trying to sell £20 million Pounds worth of shares at (laughs) £7.50. So so one of the challenges in small cap moments of liquidity is... Uh, and why? And it creates these fantastic price and onwards if you if you know your company as well and have a very clear view of what fundamental value is. The, the moment because there isn't much capital in the sector, price moves on the up and down are very very exacerbated. And if you're nimble and you have permanent capital, and you know an investment company structure is great for us because we we can take on these less liquid situations. You know, you're literally taking value that other people want to throw away. Mm. Although I suppose I was thinking earlier, that must mean you need to tread quite carefully yourself if you want to kind of start moving out for pos- position, given you're a you know significant investor in a company and so on. Yeah, absolutely. So, so you talked a bit earlier about value traps. So a key part of the way we look at quality of a company is, okay, if this company isn't valued by the stock market properly, who else could be an owner of this company? Mm. You know, we think about it in a way, I don't know if, if you remember... Victor Kayam when he used to do the adverts and Remington on the TV and he said, I like the company so much I bought it, right? So one of our <laughs> tests is, do we, would we be a conceptual owner of this company for at least five years? Do we like it? Do we like the way it makes money? Do we like the way, you know, we talked about the supply chain. Is it a decent business we'd be proud to own? And I think our view is, well, if we feel that way and, and given Ed and I spent a lot of time in PE, we know what private equity likes. Might not be the best buyer, but at least somebody, if things don't go quite to plan, and the valuation says in the doldrum, somebody else is going to want this business. And therefore, we're very, very keen to avoid companies with poison pills because mm-hmm. those are the ones we think are the value traps, the companies that basically aren't that good a company. They might have a big pension deficit. They might have a blocking shareholder that's never going to sell its equity. You know, you, you just don't want to go there. And this is why we're never going to have a portfolio of 50 companies. Yeah. One final note. We're recording this, I suppose, in the recent aftermath of the autumn statement. Um, we've survived another round of pension speculation and so on and so on. One measure that seems to still be a, a prospect perhaps for the future is this idea of a cut to 
IHT. Um, it'd just be interesting to get your your take on that, given, you know, some people think that could have an impact on the likes of AIM shares, given the tax reliefs that they currently enjoy, or some of them currently enjoy. Yes, I think it's been a topic of debate for most budgets for the last five years that we've been going. <laughs> so I think there's about £6 billion invested in AIM companies through these so-called AIM IHT portfolio services, the likes of Octopus and what have you. And it has been a bright spot in AIM. And it has seen capital going, long-term capital going and supporting many of these companies that need long-term capital. So if you look at the mansion house reforms and, and the desire of government to stimulate interest in UK equities, it would be quite unusual for them to basically take away a big prop for the aim for the aim markets, and we think if they did if they did take it away in entirety, you know you might see a very substantial derating of many of these companies, maybe twenty percent or so. So I don't think they would do that. I think there might be a reduction in the level of IHT, but I don't think it would get a, uh, abolished um, because it it's counter it's counterintuitive to what they're trying to achieve on the other side of uh, side of the table. I think I think. Inheritance tax, from what I read in the papers, and I'm sure you and your colleagues know much more about this, is one of the ch- taxes that's seen as the least just. But only four percent of states pay it, so it would be it wouldn't be the obvious thing to go and to go and cut. Mm. Um, but uh, look again, I'd be surprised if it got abolished. Could it be reduced? Yes, it, and hopefully by that stage, if there is a negative impact at all on on aim shares it can be counterbalanced by a lot of the other initiatives the government's putting by encouraging pension funds to invest a minimum proportion of their assets into unlisted shares. And I think that's something that's been quite missed by a number of commentators. The expectation was that commitment to put a minimum proportion of pension fund assets into unlisted shares. People naturally thought that was private companies, but technically AIM is unlisted. So we believe that a number of pension funds now are approaching UK small cap managers for RFPs, requests for um, proposals for managing aim pools of capital. And that's quite exciting because for many years, big pension funds have literally exited investing in small companies at all. So I think there'll be swings and roundabouts. I think the UK stock market is remarkably successful in managing through lots of crises. And I think it will this one as well. Yeah, interesting. Maybe we'll see the, the tide turn for for UK companies and small caps. Well, all very interesting stuff, but I'm afraid that is all we have time for. So I'd just like to thank Stuart for coming on. I'd like to thank our excellent producer, Maddie Apthorpe, as always. And I'd like to thank you for listening. Take care.